Welcome. In this video, I would like to address the writing process. Many times students come to my classes having earned relatively high grades in their high school writing courses, whether they be English courses or uh, history courses or philosophy courses. And then they're surprised that they don't earn the grades that they expected when they submit work in my courses. And the common mistake that I see in these students that are challenged with university level writing is that they're not following a logical process when they're preparing their papers. And it's here in this video that I'd like to talk about a process that I think will work for all students. The process that I recommend to my students has nine steps. One, begin with research. Two, list the topics that were identified during the research that would be appropriate to be included in the paper. Create a thesis statement, a debatable statement that captures the zeitgeist or the raison d'etre of the paper. What is the principal claim that you will be presenting in the paper? And that's the thesis statement. Now remember, a thesis statement must be debatable. It cannot be a statement of fact. And then outline the content that will be presented in the paper. So you have to go back to elementary school where we were taught how to write an outline before um, giving a class presentation or a uh, writing a paper. Draft the content of the paper, edit that content, format the content in the university's or the course's standard format, proofread, and then because most of us are now writing on digital devices rather than uh, handwriting or typewriting our uh, papers. We need to back up those digital files so they don't get lost, particularly uh, once an assignment has been submitted uh, through a learning management system. You want to keep a backup copy of that just in case the university's learning management system has a data storage problem, for example, a computer crash. So, working through these nine items, I'm beginning with research because one can't write unless one knows what needs to be written. And I often see students, particularly undergraduates, but occasionally graduate students, that assume they know what needs to be said in their paper and they don't recognize that the opinions that we hold are affected by the biases that we each have and the exposure that we have had to information. So, we got to start at the beginning and go see what the authors have to say, I'm sorry, what the experts have to say about the um, general topic that we address in our paper. So we need to go and log into the university library and start conducting research. Now I say log in because most of us access uh, the resources of our university libraries through a digital interface. Some schools still have a very large um, collection of physical documents, uh, but for most of us we're going to be using uh, university library search engines. So, we gather the expert data. 
we learn what experts have to say or what they have said related to the topics that we will address in the paper. We want to be able to use this data that we acquire from the experts to form logically complete arguments. Now, an argument is a claim with evidentiary defense. So, um, one can't say that something is true without demonstrating why it's true. Or, as I often say to students, yeah, who says? And if the student can't say, well, expert A and expert B said this, then I'm less likely to be persuaded to accept the student's claim. During the research process, it's very important that we annotate very carefully each of the sources that we review. So if we read an article and we recognize that this article does not contain information relevant to our general research interest, then we have to make a note to ourselves that, hey, this paper can be ignored or this book doesn't need to be read. Once we find sources that do need to be read carefully, then we take detailed notes about each of the relevant data that are uh, found within that source and look for patterns in the data. When do the experts agree on points that um, could potentially be contended? And when do they disagree? So we're looking for patterns in the expert knowledge, not just what one person thinks, but do multiple experts think the same thing. The truth is more likely to be when there's agreement on a given fact. During the research process, it's possible to start listing the topics that will be addressed in uh, your paper. It's not necessary to order these or organize these topics in any particular way, but just start making notes about this is the content that I would like to address in the paper. Once you have identified the content and you have a detailed understanding of the expert's thoughts related to those topics, it's time to draft a thesis statement. Now remember, a thesis is a debatable statement. So, um, you don't want to present a statement of fact as the thesis. You want to present a debatable statement as if, uh, in a manner that um, makes it persuasive to the reader. For example, global warming will reduce the availability of arable land by 15% during the 21st century. Now, that's not a statement of fact because the 21st century is not yet complete. But if your research led you to conclude this, you could present it as the thesis of the paper and then support that thesis with evidence uh, from your research. Another example of a thesis, American college students should study world culture. We have to be careful when we make should statements. Um, but one could argue that it is better for American college students to learn about world culture than for them to not learn about world culture in a formal manner. And the last one I put in because it's my hobby. Monochrome photographs have greater emotional effect than do chromatic photographs. I'm 
my hobby is photography and my specialty is the uh, conversion of the photos that I take to black and white format and then printing them. Um, in some of my videos when I'm zoomed out you can see I have some of my favorite photos from Europe hanging on the wall behind me. Once data have been collected during research, notes made about those uh, data sources, topics identified, a thesis statement created, it becomes time to then organize the topics into some form of a logical order that makes sense based on the purpose for the paper. In creating this outline, where one is organizing the content of the paper so that it makes sense to the reader, common means of organizing are chronological, such as in um, a history or a uh, culture course in, for, for example, I had a student write a paper in one of my courses earlier this month about the, the uh, cultural effects of uh, development of railroading in America. And the student began with background of the development of steam locomotion, the development of uh, the government support for uh, interstate rail lines, eventually the transcontinental uh, rail system, and he moved through the paper in a time sequence, a chronological order. Another way to organize a paper is purely topical. Start with the most important topic, working through the subordinate topics that are related to the primary topic. And then relative importance. Um, a student in another class recently wrote a, a paper to me about uh, the development of vertical landing rocketry. So, um, and, he, and I, as I recall, the student wrote about the difference in cost savings of uh, reusable rockets that are able to land in a vertical manner versus reusable rockets that are recovered in the ocean versus non-recoverable rocket um, systems. And the argument, the principal argument was uh, founded on the cost savings of reusable rockets that are able to land vertically compared to the um, increased costs of uh, devices where only parts could be recovered or n no component of the rocket recovered. Here's an example of a generic outline in which there is an introduction section to the paper that includes the thesis statement and background information that creates a frame of reference within which the reader will be able to understand the details presented in the body of the paper. The body of the paper, in my example, has two principal topics, each with two subordinate topics. The number of topics covered in the paper will, is usually guided by the assignment description. In a freshman level course, I'm generally pretty comfortable with students writing, um, including one or two or three main topics in their paper. In a graduate course, I would expect the student might address five to seven major topics, each with three or four subordinate topics. So you have to ask your instructor how many main and subordinate topics 
um, is expected in the assignment. Once the outline is created, and by created, I mean written down. These are, this is not just an ordering of your content that you keep in your head. You actually write the outline down. And if you followed some of my earlier videos, I demonstrated how to convert an outline into APA style headings. So you can actually double dip the outlining uh, with the formatting uh, components of my writing process. But once the outline's done, it's time to start writing complete sentences to actually draft the content of the paper. Make sure you follow the outline that you've created and write the body of the paper first. This is really important. Write your principal content first. Then write the conclusion section of the paper, your wrap-up comments, your restatement of the thesis, um, might even include a call to action if you're uh, tasked with writing a, a persuasive paper. Only after the main part of the body and the conclusion have been written can you write the introduction. So you always write the introduction last because you don't know what to introduce until you've written it. Or said more clearly, you can't introduce the arguments until the arguments have been written. You're at the point where you've drafted the body, the conclusion, and the introduction. Now it's time to edit the paper and make sure that it's clear, you've used appropriate vocabulary, your sentence, your syntax is correct, and you don't have any significant grammatical errors. Watch those commas. They tend to trip up college students. Um, and remember, no one not me, not anyone, writes a perfect paper on the first draft. Everyone, well, I don't know that for a fact, everyone I've ever met has to edit and proofread their work because the first drafts of our papers are never perfect. Once the paper has been carefully edited, it's got the minimum and it meets the minimum and the maximum length requirements. It has the appropriate number of topics. It is well focused. It's clear. It's understandable. Then format the paper and apply the required formatting uh, as stated in your uh, instructor's syllabus or sometimes your instructor's oral comments. So common formats used in American, um, at American universities are APA, the American Psychological Association, MLA, Modern Language Association, and CSE, the Council for Scientific um, editors. These are the common formats used um, at American universities. You, you have to make sure you apply the format that your instructor requires for the assignment. Once your paper has been written, edited, and formatted, it's time to carefully proofread the text. I recommend that you proofread at least three times. If possible, create a team of like-minded scholars and in which you're willing to share proofreading responsibilities for one another's papers. I have a team of three proofreaders for each paper that I write, and these proofreaders have saved my bacon on a number of occasions. 
But when proofreading, whether it's your paper or you're proofreading one of your teammates' papers, look for spelling and grammatical errors. These commonly crop up um, when homonyms are used. For example, the difference, differences but among the words there, there, and there could be T-H-E-R-E, as in over there, T-H-E-I-R, as in the possess, third person plural possessive, um, the team won their game, and T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E, as in the contraction of they are. Now, in general, uh, we shouldn't use contractions in formal writing, but we could still run into a problem with T-H-E-R-E -E and T-H-E-I-R. As homonyms, they um, can easily get mixed up, and our, the spell checker that's built into Microsoft Word will recognize both words as being correctly spelled. So, uh, unless you've turned on the grammar checker in Microsoft Word and increased the restrictions that the grammar checker uses, it's possible Microsoft Word won't flag those words if you use them incorrectly. During the proofreading, make sure that your content is clear, that you've written the intention that you wish to present. Be very cautious of making uh, uh, assumptions about the reader's knowledge or the reader's um, perspectives. And never, ever write in the second person perspective. Don't refer to the reader as in, as you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, you don't know who's reading your paper. You may be writing to your instructor, but still you don't know that instructor sufficiently well to make assumptions about uh, their biases, their perceptions, their preferences, their knowledge. When it comes to spelling, I, got, I have one more tip for you. I read my papers backward. I start with the last word that I've drafted and work backward until I get to the title. This allows me to look at each word discreetly and I'm more likely to find missing word, um, not missing words, but spelling errors or misused words, particularly uh, when it comes to homonyms and um, similar sounding words, like the words affect and effect. One is a noun, the other is generally used as a verb, and they don't mean the same thing but they can easily work their way into our paper and get misused. At all stages of the writing process, but definitely at the end of the uh, proofreading, save and back up your digital files. A rule I follow is if I were to write a particularly good sentence, I would back, I would save my document. Now, I have software already installed on my computer that automatically backs up every file that I create to, let me, I'm counting around my desk, four different storage media here on my desk and three cloud services. So that's seven backups in addition to the computer on which I'm working every time I save my document. Now, um, 
you want to kind of build the muscle memory. I'm working on a MacBook Pro, so for me in Microsoft Word, the save command is Command C. On a Windows computer, the uh, keyboard command would be Control C. Get in the habit of saving your document every time you have created a good sentence or typed out a particularly pernicious word that's difficult to spell. Once you get it right, save your document just in case something goes wrong. You lose power, um, you fat finger your document and you accidentally erase all the text on the editing screen. And the reason these backups are important is I can guarantee you at some point your computer is going to crash. And if it crashes, it's possible you could lose the data that have been stored on that computer's internal um, media, whether it's um, a hard disk or an SS uh, solid state drive. So you want backups of those files in at least two or three other locations. Now, I'll grant you, my seven backup locations may be a bit overkill, but I really don't want to lose my work. And um, I've been working with information technology systems long enough that I know how to build these backup systems myself. So, or to find low cost cloud storage uh, services. So I actually don't spend a lot of money every year on my backup systems. My typical bill is, uh, let me do some quick math in my head, 60 to one, uh, 15 to the other, that's 75, plus I probably spend $100 a year on, as my budget for replacement media. I'm, under $200 a year for my uh, backup systems. For you, if you're working on your own computer and your income is limited, then I suggest saving your files on your computer, on a portable thumb drive, and on a, a free service such as box.com, dropbox.com, Google Drive, um, Evernote, um, Microsoft's OneDrive system. All of these have free options as of today that would give you an opportunity to easily back up your files so that they're not stored solely on your uh, computer. So returning to the list of items in my writing process. I have nine of them. Conduct research and learn what experts have to say relative to your research topic. List the specific topics that you observe during your research. What are the patterns in the experts' comments about uh, your topic? Draft a thesis statement a debatable statement that captures the captures the purpose of your paper. Outline the content that you would like to present in the paper. Draft the text of the paper. Edit that text. Format it in the required standard. Proofread and get others to proofread your work also, if your instructor allows that, and back up your data frequently. <laughs> Don't wait till the end of the day to save your document. Save it every time you write a particularly good sentence or a complex word or a mathematical equation or you create a table. Save the document and save it to a backup location in case your computer 
has a problem. I hope my writing process makes sense to you and that if you choose to employ it, it improves the quality of your academic papers. Writing academic papers is a challenge for everyone. And having a system that makes the process um, a series of procedures helps me in writing better quality papers, and I hope it helps you also. I know there are many writing processes described on, uh, by university libraries, by writing te teachers, and other, by other YouTube content creators. We're all saying principally the same thing. I've just tried to organize mine around the elements that uh, I have found that are critical that cannot be ignored. In any regard, I hope that using a process for your academic writing improves the quality of your work, and I wish you very happy academic writing.